Good afternoon. Welcome to the Boca Valley Research Center virtual seminar series. My name is Dawn Hansen. I'm the executive director of the Boca Valley Research Center. I'm pleased to be hosting today from the unceded territory of the Gidimden clan of the Wet'suwet'en Nation on the banks of the Bulkley River. I'd like to thank our members for this, of the center for their support. And I'd also like to thank our funders, Wet'suwet'en Community Forest, Bulkley Valley Community Foundation, Bulkley Valley Credit Union, and the Provincial Community Gaming Grants. Without this financial support, we wouldn't be able to host these seminars and uh, be able to share information and, and connect the way we do virtually. Greg O'Neill is our presenter today, and we are thrilled to have him. Greg and I were just connecting about uh, work that the Centre has been doing uh, with him and the research forest for quite a few years, uh, supporting students as they conduct their research. And we're actually looking forward to a presentation next year from that work that's been ongoing. And so we'll, uh, we'll keep that in our, in our program. Greg O'Neill studies the nature and distribution of adaptation, adaptation traits of Northern, North American tree species and applies this understanding to help develop resilient reforestation practices in face of a changing climate. He's a professional forester with degrees in biology, forest ecology, and forest genetics. And he's worked for the last 20 years with the British Columbia government. And he's presenting today on Pining for Home. Thanks so much, Greg. Uh, thanks for being here and it's great to have you. Thank you very much, Dawn. Uh, sorry, I just got this uh, auspicious message that my computer is going to restart in two hours. So no, uh, so I'm just gonna snooze that. <laughs> um, okay, um, and um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I want to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the unceded traditional territory of the Silex people. Uh, I, uh, my, my apologies to anybody who is missing a, a particular soccer match at this point. I thank you for your perseverance. I hope you have uh, uh, recorded it as I am doing. So, um, yeah, so first of all, um, yeah, thank you for the, this invitation. Um, I'm going to um, be, it's just one second here. I'm going to be speaking about the rationale for assisted migration, um, some research, uh, the response to that research, some risks of assisted migration, and then, sorry, I couldn't keep the alliteration going, uh, the system that we constructed to um, uh, build a, an assisted migration uh, climate-based seed transfer system in BC. So th this image won't be uh, news to any folks on this call, I imagine. Um, on the left, uh, three examples of biotic impacts of climate change. And on the right, three abiotic uh, examples of climate change impacts. Now, these are, these are phenomena that have a, um, a connection to climate change. They not, may not be entirely climate change induced, but but there's, there's some evidence, some good evidence, that they are related to climate change. To the extent that the, there is genetic variation across the landscape for resistance to these traits, to these phenomena, it may be possible to um, use assisted migration to address some of these. So in BC, we're very fortunate to have uh, potentially the, the world's largest uh, provenance trial, the Illingworth provenance trial established in 1974 with populations uh, range wide tested throughout BC and a couple, of a couple of test sites in the Yukon. Here's uh, a picture, uh, two pictures uh, of the same population, uh, a, a population from a cold environment tested uh, in its home environment on the left and tested in an, uh, tested in an environment uh, 4.2 degrees warmer than its home environment. So <clears throat> on the right, on the left, we, we have a very healthy tree. I don't show the, can't show the crown here, but 
I took the photo. So trust me, uh, it's a very healthy, straight uh, tree with a full crown. On the right, the same population uh, forked multiple times as is this one, uh, riddled with galls uh, and, a, and a very sparse crown. So I would argue that you know, the tr the, these trees on the, on the right are not providing a lot of ecosystem services. Um, and this is what uh, potentially we have in store if we um, do not act. So yeah, and so I, sh I should mention that um, the, the precipitation uh, and continentality environments of these um, test sites are similar. So it's only the, the temperature that's, that's been impacted, that's been changed. So we can now, okay, so, so climate change is not good for trees. I mean, um, we see this decreased economic value and a decrease of ecosystem services. If we take all the data from those 140 populations and 60 test sites and, and build a model uh, to predict uh, lodgepole pine productivity, we see that compared with 1975, uh, 110 years on, we're gonna see a gutting. We expect to see a gutting of this, this pine basket here in, in central British Columbia. And um, in general, a, a significant decrease in productivity. Well, why is that? It's because trees are locally adapted. They have, they over, over decades, centuries, sometimes millennia, they evolve to the um, environments that, to which they're exposed. And uh, you can see here with this, this green population. So we have populations from cold to warm environments. We take a middle population. When it is grown in environments that are two, three, four degrees warmer than its origin, you see that it performs poorly. And, and the same is, is true of these other populations. So this is why we uh, have a concern. Now, the, a strategy to address this was proposed um, back in, in 92, 1992, by these two US Forest Service geneticists. And they proposed deploying non-local seed sources imported from further south or lower elevations which necessitates a system of conserving native gene pools in seed banks or clone banks. So this, this concept is, is not new. It's, it's been around for quite a while. So let's talk about some of the research uh, that we've done to, to look into this, uh, this issue. This is work by Tong Lee et al. Uh, from what, 16 years ago. And Tong Lee looked at um, the, the best performing local population um, and, and what we expect its productivity to be relative to, I think this was back in, in um, 2000 or, th or thereabouts. Um, and we see that local populations are expected to increase productivity a little bit uh, with climate change, but then decrease uh, productivity as climate change uh, continues. But if we were to look at the best performing population in each of these climates, we would expect to see uh, there are populations that perform better than local. So it, it's a matter of figuring out um, where they are. And so th th this, in general, this image is intended to um, illustrate that um, there are opportunities for assisted migration. It's one of the very few reports that attempt to quantify the impacts of climate change. So another, another approach to this question is, is the assisted migration adaptation trial. Um, and in this trial, we test 15 species. So one to 10 seed sources per species. Uh, we tested 48 sites. We planted 12 sites a year for each of four years, 150,000 trees. Uh, in red, we see the test sites, including one at um, Kitsum Kalem. And um, 
and the green illustrate the, the populations, some US populations, because we want to know um, how they might perform in Southern BC. And the objective of that trial was to quantitize, quantify safe seed transfer distance for uh, particularly for our um, selected populations, as well as to assess the fundamental niche of tree species. So this is just one example of that trial. This is on uh, Southern Vancouver Island at Nittanat. And you can see here, um, coastal Douglas fir doing very well, Western larch, not so well. And similarly at Kalamalka, which uh, if you're not aware is, if, if it weren't, um, it, in its natural, natural state is a grassland. So it, I mean, one might say one, and one's surprised that anything grows here, but we have ponderosa pine doing very well and interior spruce again, not so well. So this is what, this is what we're talking about in the assisted migration adaptation trial. So here's uh, just a few early results from that trial and, and uh, we just have a, a full set of data so that that analysis is, is underway. On the right, uh, Western larch distribution and here the, the natural distribution of Western larch in BC. The blue dots show the survival across the uh, uh, 48 test sites. Um, size of the dot represents the, the survival. So we see that outside, well, outside of its range, it can grow, it can grow very well on the periphery. And it can also grow very well at times, well outside of its natural distribution. That's a little bit misleading because I don't yet have all the points for the US, which would which would occupy the mostly these points out here. But uh, the, po the point is there are that the realized niche where, the, sorry, the fundamental niche where Western arch can grow and where it does grow, um, the, where it can grow is much larger than where it does grow. And uh, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, Ponderosa pine, even more extreme. We see it growing extremely well in climates that are considerably colder than its natural distribution. Um, Let's talk about the response, what, what's being done about this. Um, in horticulture, um, Dan McKenney and company um, redesigned Canada's uh, plant, cold hard, plant hardiness zone map um, about uh, 10 years ago. And um, then in this publication, they also they used the system uh, and they, they back cast the system using climate from 50 years prior. And, and you can see an enormous shift of uh, cold hardiness uh, zone maps, of the cold hardiness zone map. So some, some serious um, migration, uh, of course, horticulturalists may not use the term assisted migration, but um, you can see that the plants that, that one could plant say in central, uh, central Saskatchewan uh, 50 years ago um, versus presently are, are substantially different. But in forestry, we, have, we, have some, we need a finer, a finer lens because uh, you know, the, these coarse maps just don't, don't cut it for, for forestry. So we need a finer lens. So this is, pardon my, my illustration, this is a schematic of a cross section of a forested mountain. Um, cold uh, at the top and hot at the bottom. And we have a seed source. And in forestry, uh, most jurisdictions will constrain the deployment of this seed source to ensure that plantations are adapted. And they constrain it in, in various ways, but he here we constrain it with, with elevation. So as the climate warms, it effectively moves uphill. So we need to move our seed transfer limits uphill in tandem with the climate. And that's exactly what we did in 2008. We moved the seed transfer limits up 100 or 200 meters, depending on the species and the location. So I'll save you the 43 pages and give you the, the executive version up here. 
And uh, this is just a uh, comical representation of, of what I see happening on the landscape. The, the climatic home, if you will, of, of tree populations is hurtling northward or uphill. And, and many estimates have, have suggested uh, that that rate is about 10 times faster than trees can migrate across the landscape through natural migration. So there's this disconnect between the climates that trees are experiencing and the climates to which they have evolved. So uh, how do we deal with that? Uh, well, when confronted with a complex problem, we of course resort to social media. And if anybody's happened to use social media, you will have encountered the meme of being in one's happy place. And that place is usually on a beach or doing yoga or in a sunset or doing yoga on the beach with a sunset. But in all seriousness, if people have a happy place, do trees have a happy place? And I think actually that question is really central to this whole discussion. And in my view, this, this illustration right here, this so-called man hockey stick, um, is, is almost a holy grail to that question. So uh, we see in, in solid black here, the 30 year smoothed temperature of the Northern hemisphere expressed as a departure from the 1961 to 1990 average. So we see that the temperature in the Northern Hemisphere has remained relatively stable. The mean temperature has, relate, has remained relatively stable for the, from the year 1000 to the year 1900. In 1900, it spiked, slowed for a little bit during the 50s and 60s, and then it spiked again. And I have to add a few more years here because this image is from 2001. So to bring this up to, to present. Now, you're a forester in Smithers where the mean annual temperature is, I believe it's about four degrees. So you have a cut block at four degrees. You need to select some seed. Do you select local Smithers population? Well, the trees in Smithers didn't evolve in four degrees. They evolved in two degrees. Well, no, pardon me, a degree and a half. But a degree and a half cooler than Smithers' current temperature. So if you want to plant trees in Smithers that are well adapted at establishment, you'd want to go somewhere where the mean annual temperature is about a degree and a half warmer than Smithers' current temperature. So let's say five and a half degrees because those trees evolved in four degrees. Okay, so now you've got trees that are really well adapted at establishment, but they've got 80 years ahead of them and projections say that the climate's going to be three or four degrees warmer uh, in, in 80 years. So to address that, our science working group proposed um, Somewhere in the middle, actually we didn't go to the middle. We erred on the side of being conservative. We set a quarter of a rotation. So perhaps in the interior, um, 17 years, on the coast, maybe 15 years um, from now. So what is, the, what is the climate 15 years from now or 17 years from now or 20 years from now? Um, and so we add those two numbers together because, um, well, back to the future leg, if we plant a tree that's optimally adapted at establishment, clearly it's going to be maladapted at rotation. If you plant a tree that's optimally adapted at rotation, it's going to be not so well adapted at establishment. So we want somewhere clearly between those two and, and we opted for a conservative at established, closer to establishment because trees are most sensitive at establishment. Okay, so now we've got our migration distance. It's about two degrees mean annual temperature. Uh, now I should mention that we, we do this calculation for seven climate variables. I'm showing here or mentioning mean annual temperature, but we do this for, for seven uh, climate variables. Okay, 
So that's, that's some of the response, um, the assisted migration and how far to, to migrate. So let's talk about some of the risks now. Um, before we can talk about risks, we have to talk about um, the different forms of assisted migration because they, they can carry different risks. So if this is a schematic of a hypothetical population, uh, it's, it's uh, current niche and it's future climatic niche, um, then we can talk about three types of assisted migration. Um, assisted migration in range, this might be, for example, shifting uh, pine seed from Williams Lake to Prince George, for example. Or uh, we can talk about assisted migration out of range, shifting, here I got to be careful, uh, say Douglas fir from Prince George to, I'm not sure, maybe um, Mackenzie. I don't think Douglas fir grows in Mackenzie, but this is an example of uh, assisted migration out of range where we're shifting the population to a location where the species could conceivably arrive on its own, but not within our lifetime. So uh, that's what we call assisted migration out of range. And then exotic translocation is uh, shifting uh, species extremely long um, climatic or, or geographic distances where it's not expected the species could migrate uh, on its own. And uh, it's, it's generally uh, understood that the exotic translocation carries considerably more risk than A or B. Okay, so now, just drilling down a little bit, um, I've identified three types of risks. Um, first is over transfer. So here we have an example of Douglas fir being moved from Arizona to just north of Vernon near Enderby. And this is a provenance test. Uh, in the foreground, you see a bunch of dead or nearly dead trees. Uh, this is in fact the population from Arizona growing in that uh, Enderby climate. And in the background, um, I don't know if you can see them very well, but there's some nice tall uh, green trees. Uh, these are uh, local, close to local populations. And just for fun, I thought I'd show, because I had it, um, a picture of uh, the opposite transfer of uh, Vernon seed down to Los Angeles. So, and again, I'd uh, posit that neither of these uh, popular trees are, are doing much for environmental services. So that's the first risk. Now, this risk is mitigated because uh, number one, um, CBST or climate-based seed transfer, uh, what I'm, uh, which I'll, I'll discuss in, in, in the last topic. Um, this climate-based seed transfer that we adopted in BC recently follows the reference guide. It, 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 it um, we have, the, the species must be acceptable before one can select a seed source. So just be, so the species selection comes first. If the species is deemed suitable through the reference guide or soon to be KISS, then uh, climate-based seed transfer will identify the best seed sources for that location. And second, uh, CBST uses very conservative migration distances. So um, yeah, a quarter rotation into the future. Okay. Um, Second category of risk is uh, species invasion. And uh, here we have half a dozen examples, uh, well-known examples of species invasion, uh, zebra mussels, you know, it's kind of the poster ch child in BC or southern, central BC of uh, spotted knapweed, kudzu in the southern states, starling, Eurasian milfoil, and cane toad. These are very, very serious uh, problems that have caused millions of dollars that cause millions of dollars damage annually. And I mean, I remember swimming in Kamloops uh, in the lakes and then one year suddenly milfoil showed up and the lakes were just 
unswimmable. So th these are these are really serious uh, concerns. But I want to point out uh, a couple of things. You know, species invasions invariably involve long distance transfers, and they're usually intercontinental. CBST migration distances are typically two degrees mean annual temperature. And, and that equates to, you know, on average, um, about two to three degrees of latitude or, you know, three to 400 meters upward migration. So, you know, we're not even in the same order of magnitude, not even close to what these species invasions typically involve. And, and just to, to emphasize, this is a, a paper from uh, 2008, where uh, Jillian and Jessica sh uh, showed that um, invas invasive species, whether they be high, moderate, or limited severity, are much more frequently intercontinental than intracontinental. And then if we look at just the intracontinental, so these are, these are the ones that um, that, that cause the most serious harm, the intracontinental. Um, and, and I mean, we are, as I said, we are doing a fraction of the intracontinental. We're, we're talking about much, much shorter distances than this. Um, of those, plants are typically the, the least, most common of the invasive species. So not to say that invasion is not possible through assisted migration. I'm saying the, the, the risk is, is relatively low. And it, it's low because of the, the short migration distances that we use. OK, um, another category of risk are these hitchhiking pests or you know, pathogens or insects. And I'm sure you're all aware of American chestnut blight or white pine blister rust, which decimated, in this case, uh, trees in the East Coast and here, well, both both coasts, are both sides of the continent, uh, but primarily um, in the West. And, you know, the, the Kootenays and, and neighboring states had massive, beautiful stands of a white pine, um, you know, as little as 120 years ago. And, and they're virtually gone at this point. Um, now, we are not doing anything remotely close to this. And, and the reason I say that is because we haven't changed nurseries and we haven't changed seed origins. All the seed that we're using is um, from the same locations as we had it before. We're just distributing it slightly differently. So um, it's not like we're suddenly importing seed from South America or Asia. And it's not like we're suddenly getting our, our um, seedlings from nurseries in Texas. No, we're not. We're, we're using the same nurseries and the same seed sources. They're just going to slightly different locations. All right, finally, let's talk about the CBST system. So this uh, beautiful map complements of Tong Li Wang shows BC's uh, 211 um, ecosystem variants. I'm not, I'm not sure which version this is, but uh, approximately 211 uh, Beck variants. And um, as beautiful as it is, it, it can be a little bit disorienting. So I like to look at it like this. So we take those variants. I, I drop the non-forested Beck variants. And here we have BC's forested Beck variant scattered across two climate axes, mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation. We see on the bottom left, uh, the cold, dry interior, and the top right, the warm, wet coast. And uh, we can see the range from Fort Nelson to Victoria. And Kimberly and Smithers, um, not exactly close together, but uh, geographically, but climatically, extremely close together, which might explain, by the way, why Western Larch uh, from uh, the Kootenays grows so well um, in places, in parts of the, the Bulkley Valley. So now let's pretend uh, you're a seed owner. So here we're talking about uh, BCs, the, the system that was arrived at by the technical working group that developed 
kind of a seed transfer. Um, one has a seed lot uh, in a warm, relatively dry environment. Um, in the absence of um, assisted migration, we can deploy that, we deploy that seed uh, in a climate that's close to its origin. And this, as I mentioned earlier, helps to ensure that the seed lot is adapted when or in its uh, planting environment. And the further one deploys it, the less well adapted uh, it will be. Well, how big should those, should those ovals be? Well, it, it depends on the steepness of the transfer function. So here's an example of a data from one of the Illingworth provenance test sites. And we have productivity on the response axis and the provenance climate on the x-axis. And uh, Carpet Lake being at 2.2 degrees, we see that populations that are close to the uh, test site do the best, populations uh, that originate far from the test site do poorest. So if the curves are steep, if that peak is, is very pointed, then the transfer distances are shorter. And we can quantify safe seed transfer distances doing something like this. And then it's the space between the, dis the climatic distance between these two vertical bars that quantifies the safe seed transfer distance. So that's our first step is to calculate that value. And then we migrate the oval to the head of that arrow. That arrow represents, so we, we again, we do this in multivariate climate space, but that arrow represents the magnitude of the migration distance that we were talking about five minutes ago. So um, we migrate the, the oval and what we've, what we've done is drop a few test sites, or sorry, a few VEC variants here. These become no longer eligible for uh, receiving that seed lot. And we've recruited a few more over here. And what does that look like on the landscape? Well, we, can, we have this little tool, click on the eye of a seed lot, enter the species and the VEC variant of the seed lot. And then the, um, the tool draws uh, the locations, it, it lists and draws the BEC variants where one can deploy that seed source. And, and in this case, it's without assisted migration and here is with assisted migration. So we see that the seed has moved into, shifted into uh, slightly colder BEC variants. Uh, contrarily, if you are a forester with a cut block and you need to uh, reforest your cut block, where do you get your seed? Well, in the absence of assisted migration, one would get one seed from uh, inside this oval, from the seed procurement space. With assisted migration, we now procure our seed from slightly warmer climates. And again, we've dropped a few backs here, and while well, we haven't actually recruited any in this case, um, and what does this look like on the landscape? We go from this situation to this situation. We've essentially moved to a set of warmer becks. Ontario um, built a system uh, last year and um, it is very similar to BC's system. You see here, this is their cut block. Uh, this is the seed zone. Uh, the cut block is inside the seed zone. Given that they wanna reforest this seed zone, they can procure seed from any of these uh, seed zones that are slightly warmer than the cut block seed zone. If they have a seed lot, you're a seed owner with seed from this ecosystem, uh, then you, it can be deployed in these ecosystems. So I think that brings us to the end. Yeah, okay. So. How am I doing for time? 36. Okay, well, um, we're in a little bit under time. Um, I have uh, just a, since I'm under time, I have a, just a couple additional um, slides that I thought I would share with you uh, because I anticipate there might be some forest health folks in the audience. This is some recent work um, that I've done in conjunction with uh, postdoc Dawei uh, Luo, um, and uh, 
who, who recently graduated from University of Alberta. Um, and you see these, these are transfer functions for forest health traits. So here we have Western top left, Western gall, live crown ratio. This is really Dothostroma, um, uh, Dothostroma needle blight, mountain pine beetle, stalactiform blister rust infection, and this is a Lophodermella infection. So um, you see that uh, as one moves from the zero transfer distance, if one were to move seed into uh, wetter, this is mean summer precipitation, move seed um, uh, into wetter locations, you see that the Western gall rust just spikes. And in the case of, of this live crown ratio, um, with uh, one has the, the largest live crown at local. And when you depart from local, the live crown ratio drops. Um, and then the same with Lophodermella. Um, here we have zero about right here as one moves into this warmer climate. Um, the Lophodermella spikes. So we have, I think, uh, let me show five, five here, but we have about 10 examples of transfer functions that show that um, we could potentially refine our climate based seed transfer system to include forest health traits um, uh, because they just might be more nuanced than uh, using height alone. Okay, so that's that's just some ongoing work. Hopefully we'll have more on that to present. And I also wanna uh, mention just in passing that you know, sometimes we get focused on assisted migration because it's kind of a low hanging fruit, but there are other strategies available, uh, diversification being uh, one of them. Um, and Kate Peterson is working on a diversification project uh, right now. And that's the project that Dawn was mentioning. Hopefully we'll have some results on that to present about a year from now. So one could potentially diversify. Um, the tree breeders are um, madly working on developing um, or incorporating forest health traits into their selection. So this of course is extremely difficult and slow work. Um, uh, they, they have to, there's, there's a very steep learning curve to develop the testing systems, the screening systems in order to identify uh, individuals or populations that are resistant to uh, forest health uh, agents. Uh, and then the other strategy is to, uh, uh, I try to test more widely than uh, so the tree breeders are now testing more widely than they were in the past. So say in the past, they may have just had trees in the middle here in these benign environments, whereas now they're testing them in warmer and colder or wetter and drier environments in order to identify uh, individuals that can uh, potentially withstand a wider range of climates. Okay. Um, I think that is it. So um, I'd like to open this up to some discussion. Um, Dawn? Great, thanks so much, Greg. Uh, 